This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic three, global marketing. Hey, um, unless you've been living on a uh, funny planet someplace, I think it, you probably have figured out that we have become a global marketplace. Uh, yeah, trade barriers are falling. Uh, the internet clearly facilitating interchange and communication and all this. Put this in perspective, global trade right now, somewhere in the area, 27 to $30 trillion a year. Um, and marketing organizations now becoming so important, and I kind of like that. Uh, marketing organizations are pretty good. They usually don't uh, fly airplanes into buildings. They don't throw nuclear weapons at each other and stuff like that. And uh, you may be thinking, I don't need to worry about it. I, um, I don't do global. I just, I just run my own little business here in the region or something. Hey, folks, you got to be concerned about uh, global marketing, even if you only uh, market domestically, because somebody might just come right in here and take your business away from you. You don't believe me? Why don't you ask somebody that was formerly employed in the uh, shoe, textile, or consumer electronics industries? Uh, so it, it's here. Now, in the most part, uh, global trade has certainly uh, raised standards of uh, living worldwide. It's enhanced product value uh, and, and certainly quality and all that. Just take a look through Walmart and see the kind of stuff you get at the price you get it. So it's got some good stuff. But there is the downside to global globalization as well here. And, and the fact of the matter is that um, millions of Americans have lost their jobs and uh, a whole bunch more will as production shifts uh, abroad here. Uh, Ross Perot said it very well when he was running for president and said uh, there was going to be with NAFTA the great sucking sound as American jobs went on down to Mexico. Um, and basically what we're finding here in America today is this, this is really kind of eroding out the old great middle class. You either, you either have got a, a certifiable skill and education on one end or you don't and you're out of it on the other end. And for students, that's why you're in college today because you need, to have, uh, you need to have an education or a certifiable skill to be someone who can compete in the global marketing place. Here's another thing that's happened too with global, globalization, is a lot of multinationals have kind of threatened to shift jobs overseas in order to gain concessions from workers. There were some, there were some uh, <clears throat> analytical type jobs on Wall Street paying $200,000 a year. Well, the management comes to the workers and says, hey guys, uh, we think we're going to outsource these jobs to uh, India, Bang Bangladesh, or someplace like that for uh, $20,000 a year. Well, they didn't really want to shift them overseas. They used them to get concessions. And now those $200,000 a, a year jobs are paying $60,000. Uh, you may think $60,000 is pretty decent money in Pensacola. Try living on $60,000 in midtown Manhattan. Not quite the same sort of thing. Um, so the real question you got here, um, as you're getting into global marketing, the question is going to be, uh, hey, can I take and sell the same, uh, same product every single place? Um, that's nice if you can do it. That's uh, global marketing standardization. If you're Levi's or Timex, you can, you can do that. The other question, though, would be, you might have to look at a, at a different question on, uh, on what, what you're going to do as far as different product, different message on this. So in lo looking at different product and message, uh, I got to appreciate uh, a, a nation and a region's way of doing business. And uh, uh, this way here, we had uh, the story is told about a US uh, oil executive who is unaware of how the Japanese uh, basically meet each other and have kind of a ritual leading up to the exchange of business card. This guy goes, this guy walks in a meeting, he just, hey guys, how y'all doing? And just starts passing out business cards like he's dealing poker out in West Texas. Well, that's not how the way it's done here and the deal just not going through. We're not comfortable dealing with you. But along these lines, we get the question, maybe uh, can we sell the same product or a different product or maybe a different message? Um, simple, simple things enough. Different product, yeah. We're probably not going to tend to sell Big Macs where uh, cows are worshipped. We're probably not going to try to sell McRib where pork is reviled. Uh, different message can be a question too. Um, some themes like Harley Davidson had a theme. One steady constant in an increasingly screwed up world. That's fine for the USA. Coming back to Japan again, a little bit heavy for, uh, for Japan in that market. So within this, Let's think of some of the legal considerations that we have to be aware of as we get into the question on, on global marketing. And here we have uh, regulations and uh, a lot of arrangements that facilitate, or for the most part, restrict trade. We got, first of all, a tariff. Tariff simply is a tax on goods coming in. 
So Japan is going to tax U.S. rice imports in order to protect their domestic market. Uh, flip side of that, we tax the tariff on Japanese steel that comes into the United States to protect U.S. jobs and really kind of try to prop up a failing industry. Now think about this one here. We have to put a tax on Japanese steel to help us be competitive. Think about the cost of shipping steel, which is a very high weight relative to value, all the way from Japan to the USA. The Japanese can do this more efficiently and deliver the product more cheaply to the USA than we can deliver it here. Kind of suggests that maybe we're not quite up to date in that particular industry. It's something that uh, should be a concern to us. Uh, another example of tariff, we have a tax on Vietnamese catfish, kind of protect our domestic market. A quota, quota is a limit on how much can come in. So we've got sugar and dairy import quotas coming into the United States. Coming back to Harley again here. Harley back in, oh, it was in the 70s or so, Harley was, uh, was facing a real, real tough bit of competition from uh, Japanese motorcycles. What time? They're basically saying, hey, the, the Japanese are bringing these motorcycles in here and we're having a tough time competing. So they went to, to Washington and said, hey guys, come on, give us a quote on these Japanese cycles so we can get to be competitive. And they gave them the quota and son of a gun, Harley came through and the success story speaks for itself. Uh, they, they made it happen and did a, did a great job. About the same time though, the U.S. auto manufacturers, same thing, Japanese cars are coming in, they're killing us. Uh, give us a quote on Japanese cars so we can get to be competitive. The U.S. auto industry, instead of taking, taking that chance and really improving the product quality and their customer service and all, just kind of put, put the extra profits in their pocket and didn't respond, so they finally pulled down the quotas. Now, what happened since then is U.S. auto industry now is producing top quality stuff. It's really good. So I, I raised the question on quotas. It may work, it may not. Just don't know what exactly the result of that is going to wind up being. Boycott, boycott says you will not buy it. Now we may have examples on boycotts by um, groups or individuals, by the left wing. A lot of them are boycotting companies that will not make restitution for slavery. On the right wing, we have boycotts against Disney for ho hosting Gay Day at Disney World. Uh, by law, boycotts by law, Cuban cigars, can't, can't bring in cigars, can't have them, we don't like, we don't like Cuba. And, uh, or, going back to my days at, uh, at Coke, an Arab boycott of Coca-Cola at that time. Uh, Coke was doing business with Israel, oh boy, no, no. So Coca-Cola was excluded in the Arab countries, Pepsi could get in, Coca-Cola could not. Exchange control, this one's um, a little complex to figure out here. Basically, exchange control really says you got a problem getting your, getting your money out of a country and getting it converted to international currency. I had an, an old great aunt of mine retired down to some place down in Mexico for a while and then she decided, she was getting on in years, she wanted to come back to the USA and uh, get into a retirement community. She had a devil of a time converting those pesos into dollars and getting that money back to the USA. Now, here's another example, go back to Pepsi on this. Pepsi was facing a problem of exchange control both in the Soviet Union and Mexico. What they did is something I want you folks to be thinking about throughout this course. Innovate, come up with ideas, think outside the box. Pepsi went and approached it through barter. In the old Soviet Union, Pepsi has the profits. They took it out in vodka. Take it out in vodka and then they basically come up and, and, and import the vodka into the United States with agents, distributors and all that. I'd do it that way. Um, Mexico, Pepsi, instead of trying to get, the, to get their pesos out of the country, um, they're basically saying, we'll, just, we'll take it out in ingredients for our Taco Bell stores. Uh, market grouping, complex and formalized trade agreement. You got the European Union, that's kind of tantamount from uh, driving state to state. Got the common currency, the euro in many of the nations. Not in Great Britain, and I'll bet they're glad about that. But no trade barriers, virtually open borders. Closer to home, we got NAFTA, Canada, USA, Mexico. Free trade zone, but um, borders and international currencies are being maintained, and the borders really, if anything, are becoming more restrictive, uh, even with Canada at this point. Got to have, have a passport going to Canada, not just a driver's license anymore. And we've got major challenges over immigration, particularly with Mexico. So then we finally come down to global marketing strategies, and we just basically say, how are we going to do it? And so looking at this from 
basically from exporting, which is the lowest risk and lowest return, down to direct investment, which is the highest risk and highest return. So let's kind of talk about these guys uh, one at a time. <clears throat> Export. In exporting, all I'm doing, I'm selling a domestically produced product uh, through to buyers in another country. And I'm almost certainly, just as Pepsi did with, with vodka, I'm going to use buyers and agents to facilitate and, uh, and manage the distribution. So Foster's Lager is going to make their beer in Australia. They're going to send it in the USA and export it in and, and sell it here. Uh, we've got a U.S. guitar manufacturer, exports the products to Canada, sells them in Canada. Licensing. With licensing, we permit another firm to use my name, my processes, my patents, and so forth. So, some of you sitting in the audience here are probably uh, wearing T-shirts that have the New Orleans Saints or the FSU logos on them. Um, the New Orleans Saints and uh, Florida State University do not want to get in the T-shirt business, so they license that logo to a T-shirt manufacturer who produces the product, distributes them, and pays them a royalty. Then you got um, Cripsy Cream Donuts. Cripsy Cream Donuts. I know it's crispy. I call it Cripsy Cream. But anyhow, Cripsy Cream Donuts licenses. Uh, firms to basically put together and manage stores to sell the products in Canada, for instance. Now, let's think about this. Uh, gee, they could probably make a lot more money if they did this by direct investment, but well, then they got to build the stores. Uh, that's a lot, a lot of money to get that thing done, so that, you may not want to go to that end of it. Then the other, you could, could we just export them? We could export them. We could, we could, uh, we could basically bake the Krispy Kreme donuts in Minneapolis and ship them across the border. No, that probably wouldn't work because uh, Cripsy Creams after two to three days won't quite work. So they're going to take the middle ground on that, license it, let another firm be able to use their name, the product, and, uh, and, and, and basically the recipes and produce, produce the donuts in, uh, in Canada. Here's another thing, too. We're just talking about Foster Lager. Miller Beer uh, licenses Miller to be produced by Labatt's in Canada. Now, interesting question on this. For Foster's Lager coming out of Australia, they're going to export. But Miller is going to license. Now think about why. It's a positioning of the brand. Um, Foster's is high end. They've got enough profit margin in their product, they can afford to bring it in and absorb the cost of the transportation. Miller is working man's beer. So they're, they're at the low end of the price continuum on this thing. So they really do not have the money to pay the transportation of that product from the USA. Better for them to just license it there. Uh, another interesting take on this too, Disney. Disney is going to try to go in and do a theme park in Tokyo. Now they can go in and put that in themselves, but going back to the thing on culture, the Japanese culture, and, and uh, the way these Japanese businesses are so well connected with each other, they decided the most efficient way of doing that is license it to a Japanese company that has all the relationships and understands the system. So on execution, that works a lot better. Uh, contract manufacturing, I retain a foreign firm or a domestic firm to manufacture my products. So we have um, companies in Asia which are now making um, New Balance running shoes and uh, or fry boots. Now here's a little question on this one too. I happen to be, used to be totally loyal to both brands. Uh, New Balance, only made in Massachusetts. Uh, now they make those shoes somewhere in the Philippines or elsewhere. Product is absolutely as good as it ever was. Just fine, excellent. Still totally brand loyal to it. Fry Boots, they lost something. Uh, they're, they're, they went over there, the boots are heavy, they're bulky, they break down, it ain't the same thing. So guys, here's the thing. If, you, if you're going to outsource your production and have contract manufacturing, you better be sure of what the standards are and that you're getting the product that is as good as you were at this point. Which brings me to the point on outsourcing, hey, why don't you outsource your production uh, the same way to, instead of building a factory? It's the old idea of PMA, OPM, positive mental attitude, other people's money. Why build a manufacturing facility Stick to what you do best. Do the marketing and sales end of the business. Uh, find some other firm in Alabama, some other place like this, that does the manufacturing for you. You don't have to have the investment in a factory. You don't have to have the employees involved in that. It lets you get a lot more done without having to have the investment. Then we have the joint venture. We have two companies that basically work in a partnership uh, and, and utilize each other's competitive advantage. Classic example of this. FedEx and the French Post Office. FedEx is going to fly all the French Post Office's international shipments. Flip side, 
the French post office will deliver the FedEx packages all across Europe. Then we have the um, direct investment where one company owns and operates entities in a foreign country. Uh, you, you've driven up I-65, you see the Hyundai plant just south of Montgomery there where they went in and built the whole factory and now that's an, an American car basically. Oh, here's, here's another twist of this thing too. Ernst & Young wanted to get into the market in Poland. Okay, they decided, yeah, we're gonna, we want to go in there and, uh, and make a direct investment, but no one knows who Ernst & Young is. So the way they did it is they bought out an existing firm in Poland that has an established brand name people are familiar with. You do that as the first step operating under that name, then you probably go to have that name a division of Ernst & Young and finally transition to it's now Ernst & Young and let people get used to what your brand name is when they may not have been aware of it before and let them kind of gradually get to know exactly who you are and get familiar with it. Well, that's topic three. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.